Kia ora everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, first meeting of the Climate Action Committee for the term. It's just on 101. I will just open this up with a karakia and then we'll move on to the agenda a bit more formally. Uh, so anyone who wants to talk with, feel free. Um, whakataka te hau ki te uru, whakataka te hau ki te tonga. Kia mā kina kina ki uta, kia mā tara tara ki tai. E hi ake ana te atakura, he tio, he huka, he hauhu, tihe mauri ora. Thank you. Um, then I see we've got everyone here, including Ben even, and so it's just for Tipa Mahuta for slight um, lateness. And hence those being the apologies, I will move them. Do I have a seconder? Stu Nibone, seconds. All those in favour, please say aye. Opposed? Carried. Thank you. Confirmation of the agenda is the next item. Does, yeah, happy to move. Then I will second. And all those in favour, please say aye. Carried. Thanks. Uh, disclosures of interest. Does anybody have anything about this agenda in particular? We're not making um, grand decisions today. A lot of it's an introductory meeting uh, for the members and others who want to observe. And thank you to those who are observing, uh, whether you be councillors or we've even got a member of the public, which is fantastic, representing uh, GOECO, I believe, at Waikato Environment Centre. Hi, Simon. Um, all right, so if there are no disclosures, then we'll move on. So, yeah, like I said, we'll, uh, it's, a, it's quite an introductory meeting for our members. I am mindful it's an afternoon committee meeting, which is quite unusual for us. So I'm going to try my best to be quite efficient because I know what it's like after lunch. Um, I want to say thank you again to the committee members for the privilege of allowing you um, me to lead you uh, on this complex topic. And I want to just point out I am going to keep a um, a list of topics that um, if there's something where we want to learn more about it that we might have a future workshop or webinar on, then um, I'll note that down and and we'll look at when we might be able to find time to, in our massive um, schedules to, to go and learn more about that because it just speeds things up later when we are making more decisions about things. Um, and yeah, just my, my commitment to all members and every councillor that I'm happy to work with you to take you along as far as you want with any of the issues of climate change or the um, various myriad of options for resolving, whether that be emissions mitigation or adaptation. So offer is always there. Uh, in that case, we will just go into the first item there. It's item five on the agenda. It's the overview of the Climate Action Committee work program. So what's coming up for the next little while. Um, and I might just ask if Karen wants to introduce the topic a bit more. And then the, I, I think this is a really important item, hence it's first, because um, it's your opportunity to feedback onto other things you might like to touch on or hear throughout this coming year, especially. Um, but I'm mindful that we actually need to get into the meeting and learn more and so forth, and you'll have ideas later. So um, I might even hark back at the end um, to say, hey, is there anything else anyone wants to think about to pass on to Karen to consider as she plans out um, work for the next while? Yeah, handing over to Karen. Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, councillors. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon, those who aren't members, and welcome to our new members on the committee. And welcome, Simon. Good to have you here. Just for your information, we also have staff members who are part of our Climate Action Roadmap Advisory Group. Um, not all of them will be jumping in and out today, but I did want to introduce you to some of those who are available so you can see the subject matter experts supporting us through this work. Online, I could see Tutahunga Douglas, part of our Tairanga Whenua Group. Um, we have Tracy Burgess-Jones, who's a new staff member. Welcome, Tracy. Tracy has joined us in the farm advisory service and has a particular interest in um, the carbon space and GHG emissions reduction and supporting farmers with this work. 
I also have Blair Dickey online. Blair is indeed a subject matter expert who has been working deeply in this space for more than 20 years and has um, contributed enormously to New Zealand's climate response. Blair is currently stuck in the South Island because of ferry cancelling, so he'll be online soon. So thank you, Blair, for joining us. Um, Inga Voss is our communications advisor, and so she ensures that we always have a story that comes out of these meetings so that our community can follow the activities being undertaken at Council. In the room behind you, you have Rick Lifting, who is our team leader of our regional resilience program. We're really lucky to have Rick here because he has been so very, very busy over recent weeks, as you will be. Yeah. And Lisa Armstrong, who is our sustainability and climate advisor. Lisa has been project managing our regional risk assessment and supports the Climate Action Roadmap Advisory Group with their work program. I hope I haven't left anyone off. Apologies if I have. Now, this first item is really an opportunity for you, councillors, to give us your direction and set the next three years for us. I've just chopped it down into the first year because often it's quite difficult to look three years in advance. But we do have between pages six to ten. We've just outlined, first of all, what this committee is here to do, what our objectives are and how we fit with the other committees of council. The benefit of the Climate Committee, as staff and I believe councillors have experienced over the past three years, is that this committee can take a vast array of different pieces of information and bring it together to understand and respond to climate, which is a cross-cutting issue that affects and impacts on every part of our business. Because of that, Every committee of council does have an interest in climate response. And so transport has a, has a whole work program focused on a climate response. Similarly, the integrated catchment management is looking at climate response, both how it protects and increases resilience of our communities, but also what's the impact of the climate on our assets. And what's the risk profile of our assets? Strategy and policy, that has the whole strategy and policy work program going through there. And of course, we have Annika. Annika, apologies, will be coming in um, at item three to talk to us about how we are incorporating the national climate plans into our own work programs. And that will be running through the strategy and policy committee. Um, Risk and assurance, they look at climate. So it is just across the whole business. The opportunity here is we pull it together and then bring it back out again. So we cover across governance, strategy, risk management, and the metrics and targets. And Lisa will talk to you a little bit about our internal work program so that we are me measuring and monitoring and managing our own emissions across the organization. For the next year, we've identified as our key priorities an update of the regional greenhouse gas inventory. And this is a piece of work that we do across the region, understanding the region's emissions, the sources, and the opportunities for reducing those emissions. We also cut this down into district level so that the districts and the city council can see where their opportunities for emissions reduction lie. Their profiles are very, very different, as you can imagine. The rural areas, mainly that's related to the agricultural activities. The city, 60% is transport, completely different way of addressing these issues at those district council levels. We are progressing the phase two climate change risk assessment, and this will help us prioritize the adaptation planning and the targeted actions we will take at place and with mana whenua and communities. This will also feed in to the regional spatial strategy coming through the resource management reforms. Some time away, so there's 
work we can be doing in the interim. Annika will talk to you about the actions that we're incorporating into the National Adaptation Plan and the Emissions Reduction Plan. We have to take these actions and we have to have regard to them in our own plans. Inga online there to help us with our ongoing engagement and communication and stakeholder relationships, because this is actually about everybody having a part to play in this, not just this council. And then finally, it is another focus is reducing our own emissions and um, our flood pumps have been running at something like or more than 100% capacity to what they were previously. And we can't turn them off. We have to keep going. But can we make sure that they're running as efficiently as possible? So that's part of that work program. So I'm really interested to hear what matters most to you, what you want to focus on. We have programmed in room for workshops. First workshop will be in April to actually discuss suggested changes to the Climate Action Roadmap. But you will also have areas of interest that you want to explore and to put into the work programs that we have. You might also choose to do what the last council did, and there was they invited to every meeting after the meeting or before the meeting, there would be a recognised subject matter expert from New Zealand in any aspect of climate response. So we covered um, agriculture, we had transport, we had um, uh, yeah, uh, resilience, the Blinda story came to talk to us about opportunities for climate leases. We had risk and advice there about looking at liability. So it, it was a broad program of work. And um, if you wish, we can continue that as well. On that note, I will draw your attention to pages nine and 10, which is just a draft work program showing the items, topics that we wish to cover throughout the year. And that they will be covering aspects of mitigation, that is reducing emissions, adaptation, building resilience, and then just the communication engagement opportunities. Thank okay, you, Thanks. Yeah, so you can see there's, we spent a lot of last term uh, learning more, uh, whether it be staff or councillors, and we um, have quite a good foundation to, to populate this table to, to build on. Um, but yeah, really keen to hear what, what people think. So I think the first up is uh, Mike, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, yeah, thank you, Madam Chair and Karen. Yeah, so probably being a new councillor, you know, and another new committee to get my head around. Um, I suppose it comes down to, for me, um, is probably your conclusion hit it, hits it on the head where climate change response and the program is focused on providing evidence-based, you know, to make good decisions, that evidence-based. Now, have we had enough evidence base over or over the last three years? Because if you look at probably from 2018 to 21 councils, probably climate change, you know, we'll see what happens. You know, they they were a little bit unsure. And then probably 21 to, to 24, if I'm mistaken, was, you know, a lot more focus on, on what can be done. I'm, do, I'm just wondering, you know, is this a collaboration with, other regional councils or councils on how you've come to to find your evidence base. You know that's what I'm trying to get my head around because you know I've, I've read all the all the diagrams and stuff like that. But that's a good question. How do we, how do how do we know that that evidence base is is at the right level to make those good decisions at this stage? Yes, two thousand and twenty three. Thank you. Thank you. Um, certainly, we. We have evidence comes through those international panels, the IPCC, which is the internationally recognised um, source of information for climate globally. We have many New Zealand scientists actually serving on those panels. So a lot of that content is either generated or peer reviewed by recognised New Zealand experts as well. So it is relevant to the information we get. There are also a number of national science challenges looking at very specific areas of climate change and climate response in New Zealand. And 
we draw on that information, we are also involved in peer reviewing their work and feeding back to them and contributing to those papers. And you have experts on your own council, on your own staff who contribute to that work. And some of them are in the room today. Um, from the science perspective, our science teams are working at regional scale with their counterparts, but they also reach out internationally as well. And they are looking at the water security matters. They're looking at the soil science issues. They're involved in biosecurity and biodiversity. And there is a solid body of evidence there to refer to. Um, Rick will be able to talk to you when he talks to the risk assessment about the work that's been done to understand and have a really solid evidence base for the risk and resilience program. Um, there, the work is ongoing and we are constantly building up the expertise and competency in-house. Questions? That's a um, good question, but in noting that this morning when we did have um, previous workshop, the um, we got some good feedback from um, Auditor General's office around how they've seen a shift in the councils over that time. Um, and so the maturing here, I'm I'm bringing to the the strategy when I speak to Karen as well is that we need to mature and move from just the learning about and where's our place to um, really figuring that. And evidence base is is a word that's come up the entire last training as we were figuring that out because there's a lot of talk out there. Um, to navigate through, and I spend a lot of my spare time to try and figure that out so that we don't waste our time on something that isn't going to resolve something. Um, and But since you said that, it just prompted an idea that I had that I'm keen to canvas with all of you, and that's to um, see if we are open to the idea of having uh, some feedback from some other external voices on how they think that we're going as a committee or as a council on this topic. Because I've seen in the past uh, that councils can get criticised, say in the media, for doing, for going down a certain path or doing too much or too little and so forth. But if we were to create a space or a group of people, whether that be informal or formal, to just um, give feedback maybe once every six months to the committee or, or even a bit uh, less frequent or more frequent, um, the kind of voices I've been thinking, uh, it would be really good to utilise the, the experts we've got locally. So um, at the University of Waikato, they've got um, since last year, I believe, the Bachelor of Climate Change, and they've hired a senior lecturer there uh, for that topic. Um, and, and a lot of those presenters that we had in the last training would also quite qualify to, to have that critical friend element. But also um, getting, we've said in here in the terms of reference that we want um, Wataranga Māori coming through as our evidence base as well. And I'd say we're still a bit light on that and that there's an opportunity there to get some Indigenous worldview voices coming through in that feedback as well. Or perhaps the youth voice from the Rangatahi voices that got set up last trainium. Um, and, or, or whatever else we come up with as to who we believe would be a good critical friend to have around. So I just wanted to put that out there. But before I speak too much, Clyde and then Pamela, please. <laughs> Go for it. Oh. Just. Oh. Is it? Is that on now, is it? Yeah. We're good. good. Up, Pamela. Okay. Um, About eight years ago when I was a uh, member. Council, um, we were presented with a uh, model of sea level rise in the Coromandel area, which alarmed a lot of residents. I got some feedback myself where they wanted to string me up and, um, because it had an impact on properties and resale, etc. So it would be nice if we could get those modellings that were done and presented to Council eight years ago. Then have an assessment, a reassessment now, and just show us the differences, how far those sea levels have risen uh, in, the eight, in those eight years. And I think that'd be interesting for a lot of people to see. And then we could work on, did they go over the top, scaring the public um, with the modelling, um, or was it accurate? So what I'm hearing there is, um, and, and um, it's a good topic to bring up because the NZC Rise project 
gut had some data come out um, just last year, which was really interesting and for the Cromandel in particular. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be a good piece of work to bring up. Again. Yes, but also and to communicate to appropriately. To present the other one. what we were presented as well, just to present what the modelling looked like back then to see if it was eventual yeah. or not. Yeah. And another thing, talking about inviting um, outsiders, um, Rowan Wells was a, a scientist for uh, NIWA, and he was on, he presented to my committee the um, EPC some years back, and he's a climate scientist. Maybe we could look at, he's retired now, but maybe look at getting Rowan on as well to do, I could ask or someone could ask him um, if that's possible as well. He's got a little bit different point of view, so I think that's important. Oh, cool. If that's possible. And I heard something in there about communicating appropriately as well, because that's come up in the past. It's really important, and that was why it was part of the goal under the strategy was to, um, I hear what you're saying. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Pamela. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just, I was reflecting on um, the uh, collab workshop we went to on risk and assurance, yes. and it was talking about, you know, it was showing the, um, I'm not going to get all my terminology right, but essentially the, the interactive interconnected web of so many uh, risks, some being emitters and some being, I can't remember what the other one, receivers, there you go. And yeah, and, um, and response to climate change was shown as one of those fairly complex Mm. Um, interconnected. Yeah, <laughs> and 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 the issue that that raised in my head was how we ensure that that when an item or a subject is heard by a number of committees, that we don't lose track of who ultimately is responsible for making headway or delivering on things. Because I'm I'm looking at like um, item seven of our agenda today is also item nine mm. of the strategy and policy committee tomorrow. So so the issues I'm concerned about are, are that we might lose track of who has ultimate responsibility. I'm also mindful of uh, this council's desire for cost effectiveness and efficiency and, um, and making sure that we're not hearing the same presentation across multiple committees because that's when it gets a bit muddied on on who who yeah. sets the direction or or who's ultimately responsible and and so just wanting to raise that as as a consideration when we look at the work program of this committee i suppose that the other thing that i would raise would be that i i think it's great to to get outside uh, viewpoints and information i think that it's a, it's important that we walk the talk and climate action and that if we're having presenters that they're coming in via via Zoom or online or 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 something like that, as opposed to flying people in, I think that that's like counterintuitive that. to the to the um, uh, direction of this committee. Yeah, thank you also to that one. Um, and uh, I thank you for bringing that up. I meant to mention it when we were um, confirming the agenda. I had noted that that is the same in the committee that I'm also in tomorrow. And actually, all of the members here are other than uh, Tipper. So um, Tipper can let us know at the time um, what kind of what degree of presentation she'd like to see, or because I believe it is a topic that she's fairly well across. So, so just a heads up for later, Tipper, um, because we could uh, potentially leave a lot of that presentation for tomorrow, as you say, or indicate, um, and then there'll be more councillors at the Strategy and Policy Committee as well as ourselves to feed in. But hey, here's an opportunity to. Um, Give two cents if you, you know, since you've read your papers and you're ready, raring to go. Uh, ben. Yeah, it was just um, coming in this morning listening to the radio. Um, I'd like everyone to get a link to the Radio New Zealand News item that said that New Zealand has a $12 billion bill that it's likely to have to pay to overseas countries to mitigate its climate by 2030 or 2027 yes. or something. Yes. I mean, I don't think it's worth knowing about. I don't think sure. we were aware of that. If, unless we can resolve the issues internally, we pay billions of dollars. And um, so I'd like everyone to get a copy of that. So at least we know that that's sitting on the table and. Yeah, really happy about to, to share that. Us. Yeah. Yeah, we'll definitely send that out very soon. Um, so. 
just as a bit of context for that one. Um, and, and this council has, in all its submission to central government that I'm aware of, always pushed back on this idea of buying offsets overseas, um, which is what that money would go towards um, to meet our um, carbon budgets that have been agreed to. Uh, but yeah, we'll, I can cover that off more when we send out that email. Um, okay, then, Stu? I just going to say, um, I think the um, the work program you've mapped out for the next 12 months is, is good. The devil is in the detail in terms of how we dig into these some of these subjects and, and obviously... Um, so working with EWI on climate adaptation, I, I think we want to put a bit of thought into what that looks like in practice, um, particularly given that our, a lot of our JMA partners are on pump and, and whether they've got a specific one of them that's a bit more focused on this, I, I, I don't know, but, but make sure we, we get something constructive out of that. Um, obviously, I'm really interested in the land use adaptation and mitigation one as well, and a little bit of a talk to do there. And, I find it quite fascinating listening to all the criticism of forestry at the moment. No one's mentioned the fact that the land, the land where the forests were was originally cleared for pastoral agriculture. They then thought, oh shit, that wasn't a very smart thing to do because it's eroding and falling down the blooming gully. So let's chuck it into Radiata. That might be a better option. And then they've discovered that, hey, that wasn't such a smart idea now. But it's all the foresters' fault. That, um, but uh, I guess the point I'm making is that we need to look at the bigger picture and, 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 and with a bit of a holistic view in terms of it and make sure we don't have some stupid knee-jerk reaction in terms of how we how we fix it. Um, and, and it's all about... And, and look, this whole issue of... Um, do we rebuild... How, how many of these houses that have been damaged in, in the events of the last few months do we rebuild um, in the same place, you know, um, versus that challenge they've got that we need to get some houses up really quickly because a lot of people have homes and we might necessarily have the luxury of time to, to relocate. So it's been quite challenging um, discussions. And um, I'm assuming that um, the update on the, the risk assessment be taking into account anything we've learned over the last two or three months as well. And I guess that reflects a little bit on, on Clyde's comment. Yeah, yeah. And that'll look. But look, I think you're fundamentally on the right track. So. Um, and, and just the other one I was going to say, I've forgotten who made the comment, it might have been Pamela, I think, about um, how these agenda items interact with the agenda items on other committees. And, and I think um, it's probably a role for you, Pamela, as chair, to reinforce the need for the committee, respective committee chairs, to make sure they're engaged with what's happening at the appropriate level, um, and um, that that, we're, that the council is is appraised of all the different fractions at, at the right times. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'll just go Tipper first, and then we'll go back to Benjamin. Um, I just wanted to express my support for the work program um, and ask uh, in terms of the last point, um, Stu, you talked about and Pamela too, about the natural intersect um, of this item. So my assumption was last term that where there was a climate um, gain that we could make in any of the committees that we would do that and we would act that way and that's why um, the matters that intersect would go through, hopefully, with a view from the Climate Change Committee to help inform whether it's ICMC or any of the other subcommittees, and that we were going to lean towards um, action in these areas. Uh, so just want to test that assumption with the committee, because if it's not that, then if we have to talk about climate in both spaces, because this advice isn't being taken on board, I would be concerned because it would be out of sync for where I think our community wants us to worry. Um, <clears throat> to Arua, thanks, Jim, for bringing up Mato Ranga Māori, not just working with iwi on climate change, because they are uh, just just by habit, uh, just by story, just by history and context, there's some places in this country we've just lived longer and have watched longer than pe other people. So if, if we don't build on the benefit of that knowledge and that modelling into what we do, we're doomed to repeat it. Um, 
The other one, due to your concern about every participation, they're in the climate, National Climate Adaptation plan, um, Place anyway. Um, it may not be all of our river iwi, but there are views being formed on behalf of the um, iwi chairs. They went up to um, the last <clears throat> COP conference as well to present that view. So there is a whole stream of iwi Māori advice and climate now. I don't think you have to look as hard. Specific localised advice though by Kaitiaki of how, how long ago that river ran that way. Um, that's work for our council to do. Um, with our local community, I would have thought. So again, I um, think we've got most things covered, but what are the, where are the messages from this committee going internally and then how are they expressed externally? What will they look like when people are know we're doing climate um, resilience or regional resilience? We're not just talking about it and educating ourselves. Kia ora. Thanks for that, Tipper. And yeah, it touches on one of um, the very last thing you mentioned, touches on one of my points as well, of having a good think about how we want to communicate um, and what's our place in the landscape about um, informing people about things. We have uh, and we distribute some pretty amazing scientific data about how things will change over time. Uh, we've got that uh, with the help of NIWA and so forth. And so how that is made. Uh, interpreted so that everyone can digest it is something that's often on my mind. Uh, Benjamin. Oh, it was just to say that um, I hope this is a can-do committee and I just wanted to pick up Stu's point about forestry. Um, I think forestry is very important. When you look later in our document, 44% of our reduction comes from forestry. So if, if we don't promote forestry, I mean, if you look at $12 billion, assuming a billion dollars has got to be saved in this region alone, get a little bit of transport, but we're going to have to plant more trees. And that is also something that Māori are heavily involved in. So I just wanted to make sure that we're not all agriculture focused and that we look at other sectors. So Yeah, definitely. No, it's That's the hard part of it, is getting across all the different sectors and not prioritising one over the other, even if it's got a big... Um, number attached to it because sometimes even the the other sectors can uh, set the culture, set the narrative, set the tone, um, even though the numbers there to be gained might be small. I'm not saying that in this case, but on the topic of forestry, it's always been a, a, a narrative of this council that we um, very much supporting that right tree in the right place, not um, just blanket forestry kind of just to fix our one problem, but we'll create a bunch of others. So, And that conundrum of how to get the, the biodiversity issues addressed at the same time as the climate issues is something where I'd really like us to mature into further as well, um, because we do still have um, them in quite separate categories at times, but the causes of both those issues are very much aligned. Um, do I have any of... Yeah. Respond to that. Um, if you look at South Waikato, which is part of my area, um, it's flat, you know, it's not got the problems that Hawke's Bay has got and Gisborne's mm. got. So we, we, as long as you can deal with slash and those sorts of things and cult, multi, yeah. plant, cultural planting, then yeah, it's just, I, I struggle to see how we're going to solve meeting our targets. Yeah. Yeah. And it's a system thing. So when you change one thing, it affects another thing. But um, just while, because you're mentioning slash, what's something I'm keen to explore at some stage further, and I'll put on my list of things to understand more is uh, potential for slash management for um, potentially feeding the all the biomass boilers that are popping up. Because some of you may have seen in the paper around how Fonterra and Genesis are, are really heading in that direction, or at least trialling it um, here and there more. And so obviously that would require a whole bioeconomy infrastructure to, to process from one place to the other. But it is a, uh, a thing where we could solve two problems at the same time. Uh, I'll just have a look at my list, whether there was anything else. A huge focus on resilience is, is in here, but we can talk about that more in the roadmap pathways. And um, on the item of biodiversity crisis, meeting the climate crisis kind of thing, um, I was thinking it would be a really cool topic to bring to councillors to introduce the concept, scientific concept of planetary boundaries and perhaps partner, I haven't yet spoken to um, Clyde about this, but partner with EPC to have a look at um, what 
that looks like. Um, but we will can touch on that when the time comes. Um, and methane and the split gas approach is something I think our councillors would all really appreciate knowing a bit more about. Uh, and that's it from me. So um, do I have a mover for this item? Oh, Stu. And then I'll uh, Benjamin's seconds. And so all those in favour, please say aye. Carried. Thank you. Then that's one of the more substantial items out of the way. Uh, so Tipper, uh, just a question. Did you want to comment on anything or see much of a presentation on this next item about the overview of the RM reforms and the climate response since you're not part of the strategy and policy committee tomorrow? Sorry, Jen, I'm just turning that page <laughs> over a sec. Oh, um, oh, sorry, it's um, the actions arising from them. Is that the one, Pamela? Seven, right. Apologies, I've got the two mixed up. So tipper, item seven is one where own, um, strategy and policy is getting the same presentation tomorrow. So um, if you could let us know whether that's something that you want to contribute much to or, or whether you want to see the presentation today, just let me know, please. Um, but I've, no, um, I've, I've seen and understand where this one's going, um, but it, just because I'm not in Stratton policy, uh, just to be aware that all our EU partners are also speaking into this space. So it makes sense that we be informed, um, that we ask them, I guess, for their views on or how they want to work in the space with us more proactively. Yeah. yeah. That I don't know if, if we've deliberately asked in the JMAs. But if this is going to become how it is, how are we going to get a working model or a prototype of how we might work through these things, this planning arrangement? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Leading that into makes, it. Kia ora. Thank you. That makes sense. So in that case, since we kind of just covered that one then, shall we uh, just receive item seven, um, pass it now, and then we can go back to item six? Yeah. If everyone's happy, because then we can cross that one off. Um, so I'm happy to move item seven just to receive the report and mindful that everyone else on the committee will see it again tomorrow. Small admin, small admin error. Apologies for that. Annika, are you online? Kia ora. Yes, Karen, I'm online. I'll leave it to the chair to introduce you then. Hi, Annika. Hi, would you like me to pop down? Sorry, I had um, I had expected the, the different order. Uh, no, that's all right. Um, hold on one sec. Uh, Annika, <laughs> I hope you don't mind, but I'm kind of thinking rather than running through the same presentation twice that we just present it tomorrow for that's, the strategy and policy. Yes, that's fine. Yes, I can present it tomorrow at strategy and policy instead. Oh. Works well for you, Warren. Uh, as well. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. Just mind, mindful that we can um, cover it there, and we'll we can talk to the climate points there at the same time. Thanks, Annika. I appreciate that. Oh, Tracy. Hi. Was there any oh. specific feedback you wanted from this committee, Tracy? Um, no, and good afternoon, Chair and Councillors. Um, there was a method to the madness, I guess, of having the dual reports. Uh, you'll see on the uh, page that has the tables, it's quite a comprehensive work program. We also have a work program discussion in front of strategy and policy. So it was thought a good idea to identify for councillors that mm. the strategy and policy work program will also encompass from an advocacy perspective the work program uh, that the Climate Action Committee will feed into considerably. That's the reason. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, thanks, Tracy. Appreciate that. And yeah, this is a full submissions work program. We've already gotten to know that fact. Um, and look forward to, to the next ones to come. All right, well, in that case, I've moved it and Benjamin seconded. Um, all those in favour, please say aye. I um, carried. Thank you. Then we'll jump back to the previous item, which I had confused, um, which is the overview of the resource management system reforms and um, in particular the climate change aspects of that, uh, which I believe we've got Blair Dickey online for to present. Um, 
the key point I took from this on reading the agenda was that we do ha there are actually some powers under the present system um, before the RM reform comes in. Um, be interesting to see how um, they can get uh, implemented now that the focus is more on climate uh, and uh, that we certainly need that alignment between central government and local government um, to do so. Um, yet we're all avidly looking forward to the Climate Adaptation Act coming in so we can address, address the th um, things that have come about from past decisions. But uh, unless Karen's got something else to mention, I'll pass over to Blair. Do you have something? No, I think it was just an opportunity to give the committee an overview of the legislative framework in which you operate, the impact of the RM system reforms and how that will make um, and further assist the council to respond to climate change. But most importantly, as the chair pointed out, we really do need the Climate Adaptation Act because we cannot resolve the question of how we will apportion share of the costs of adaptation until we have that. And the challenge of, of responding to those communities so hard hit by the cyclone um, just kind of remains our hands feel tied until we have that direction. Yeah. So thank you. Um, now Blair has about six slides and this should just give you the overview and then he'll take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Kia ora koutou. Kia As Karen mentioned earlier, um, for various reasons, I'm trying to bring my car back to the North Island um, and I've um, got so as far as coming to you from Richmond, in the sunny Tasman district. Um, apologies for not being there in person. Uh, with that introduction, uh, Madam Chair and Karen, um, perhaps any questions? But uh, that, that was probably a bit flippant. What I thought I'd do is just um, run through some key points and highlight differences between what our obligations are currently and how these have been built up um, for addressing climate change and our responses and what the opportunities are in the new system um, and really our expectations of that. Uh, next slide, please. And next slide, please. The current um, obligations under the Resource Management Act have been built up over time in a series of key steps. And these have generally um, been in response to international um, drivers. In 2004, we um, had the requirement um, to have particular regard to the effects of climate change. And this was in part two of the RMA section seven, and it applies to district councils as well as regional councils. And at the same time, the, it was recognized that uh, the um, benefits of accessing resources that contained renewable energy was also important in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And this was uh, conveyed through national direction and through the a change in the um, Resource Management Act as well. But at the same time, uh, the government also recognised that it had some tools that were able to assist economic sectors to reduce emissions. And it didn't at that stage um, recognise the benefits. Well, it, it uh, rejected that there was a benefit of alignment of um, policy levers from local government with central government and reserved entirely to itself and a financial system to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions through initially a um, uh, carbon tax as it was uh, introduced in 2002, but that didn't seem to um, go down too well. And that morphed into emissions trading um, by 2008. And at the same time, regional councils were restricted from treating greenhouse gases as a contaminant to the environment. Um, 2017, uh, another introduction was made and uh, recognised that um, we're at risk from natural hazards. And this was um, in response to a number of drivers, but it particularly relates also in this context to those climate change exacerbated natural hazards. 2020, um, we had a significant amendment to the Resource Management Act, which brought in the essential fresh water 
um, requirements. Uh, and at the same time, there were seven sections to that Amendment Act that uh, required us to have regard to the National Climate Plans, and that is the Emissions Reduction Plan and the National Adaptation Plan when changing policies and statements and um, policy statements and plans under the RMA. And at the same time, uh, in that amendment, that restriction on regional councils to address greenhouse gas emissions as contaminants was removed. Um, it was a change of thinking that perhaps we do need uh, consistent alignment of central and local government policy to affect change. And that was uh, came into uh, force on the 30th of November last year. Next slide, please. So in summary, um, historically for the last 20 something years or 19 years, central government has um, taken the uh, the heavy, lift, heavy lifting role uh, with respect to mitigation, and that's what its focus was on. That was primarily because of the international obligations the country had signed up to under the um, uh, framework convention on climate change and particularly the um, change when it was ratified um, that was when the Kyoto Protocol was ratified in 2002 and the changes we had to make in 2004 I'll just mentioned those at that stage it was considered that adaptation being local um, was best uh, addressed at um, local government level, and that certainly we have the tools. District Council have the land use and, and urban form tools. Regional councils have the resource allocation tools to address um, the regional changes in climate that um, we are going to need to adapt to. Now that changed in 2015 when the government signed up to the um, Paris Agreement, and for the first time, adaptation was put in there as a requirement for nations to develop adaptation plans. So central government could no longer just say adaptation was the role of district and regional councils, local government, but it had to take a role itself in developing a national adaptation plan, which it has done, and we have to now have regard to that. Having regard to it means that there may not be a, um, a discernible change in a policy or you may not um, see it uh, identified as a rule in a plan, but certainly there is an expectation that it is considered in the policy making process. So the expectation is that it would be addressed in some way in the Section 32 documentation of that policy design process. So in summary, we've had, um, you know, for the best part of nearly two decades, the requirement to um, have regard to the effects of climate change, that's the adaptation, and also the benefits of accessing um, renewals, renewable resources containing uh, energy. And that certainly um, was one of the driving um, elements of the geothermal review and uh, work in 2005. Um, and that left central government to address emissions reduction through financial levers, and that's the emissions trading scheme. Territorial, just um, when I mentioned before that regional councils, because of the double jeopardy issue, were restricted or prevented from regulating point sources, there was never any restriction on territorial councils um, from addressing greenhouse gas emissions from land use. And that includes a number of um, green, uh, a number of emission sources. You can look at um, storage of coal, coal mining, peat mining, peat drainage, landfills. These are land uses that are regulated primarily through um, district plans, but also have and contribute to greenhouse gas emissions locally. Also, as well as having that direction within the primary statutes, sub um, national, well, the um, secondary legislation that applies at subnational level that we have to um, give effect to 
um, also recognised that climate change was uh, an, an element to be included. So we've had the NZCPS, the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement, which works um, in the primarily actually um, in the coastal environment on territorial councils, that's building in coastal areas that are risky. Um, the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management, working almost exclusively on regional councils for the allocation of discharges to uh, water and takes of water during times of stress. Um, the more recent NPS uh, urban development, again, working primarily on land use decisions from territorial councils, but also uh, regional council policy statements with the strategic integration of infrastructure with land use. The NPS, uh, Renewable Electricity Generation, working both on regional councils and uh, with regional plans through the allocation of resources such as coastal space, um, geothermal resources and hydro um, resources, and also um, district councils land use decisions for those renewable sources of or sources of renewable electricity, energy that aren't technically consentable. They're consented on the effects of the land use or the technology that's used. So we're talking wind turbines and solar panels. And um, the National Environmental Standard on Air Quality uh, for flaring landfill gas and also the proposed national policy statement for indigenous biodiversity, recognising that our indigenous flora and fauna need to adapt to a changing climate as well, and that's going to take land use. So that's a um, regional and district um, responsibilities to give effect to those. So this is an interesting um, sort of element because while we now have to have regard to the um, national climate plans in our policy making and our plan making, we have to give effect to this national direction, which includes specific direction uh, in relation to um, climate impacts through the, um, the current national direction. And uh, next slide, please. Picking up on uh, Councillor Chair Stories, um, comments about uh, efficiency. I don't intend to go into uh, the ins and outs of the proposed, what we understand of the uh, proposed new resource management system, other than to say one of the driving issues was um, the perception or that the response to climate change has been ineffective under the current system. Um, and this is mirrored in the objectives for the uh, reform in the next slide, please. In that they're designed to better prepare us for adapting to our changing climate and the risks from natural hazards um, and as well as mitigating the emissions that contribute to that climate change. So um, it's, it's wider in scope than the current um, system, which is primarily um, related to uh, what well, has historically been related to adaptation, um, but now it's becoming much more aligned in both central government direction and also the expectation of our um, local government to also address emissions reduction. So I'll actually just focus a little bit more on adaptation. If we can have the next slide, please. As it is, um, the elements of the new system, and this is how it's been um, summarised, if you like, and this is I'm taking this from ministerial um, statements because um, we we still don't know what the final um, outcome will be. But the recognition is that New Zealand already has billions of dollars of at-risk assets in areas that are, and we've seen floodable, and also in in the coastal environment. Um, potentially uh, in erodible, coastally erodible places. And the expectation is with respect to adaptation is the pairing of the Spatial Planning Act and the Natural Built Environments Act will give us the, um, will, the ability to identify where um, those high risk areas are and where it is 
perhaps more appropriate to invest uh, for the future in areas of lower risk and also to adapt uh, the planning for and construction of supporting infrastructure in those lower risk areas. But that doesn't help us for what we're facing now, where we've already, as I mentioned, um, got billions of dollars of at-risk assets. And so what is a range of um, response options are there to accommodate, to design, to um, uh, in the in the final um, uh, analysis to actually exit those at risk areas. And this must be sort of a local process with engaged community um, activities. But we still don't have um, at the present stage a um, system where we've uh, we we can undo decisions of the past and actually provide financing. So from what we've gleaned from, and we haven't seen this yet from ministerial statements, is that um, the Climate Adaptation Act will deal with those complex issues um, associated with managed retreat, um, in, including undoing pleasant planning controls or decisions and providing some sort of finance. Uh, next slide, please. So oh, this is, and you've seen this, and this is re produced from your uh, report. This just shows in the new system, and this is below legislative, um, uh, the legislation in the secondary uh, areas, just where the National Adaptation and National Emissions Reduction Plan will enter the um, the new resource management system and it works upon that's that um, red ellipse there it works upon the national planning framework now currently we have to have regard to those climate plans once it's incorporated into the national planning framework we will have to give effect to the um, uh, corresponding national direction for both emissions reduction and adaptation. So it's a much stronger um, uh, requirement and that will go straight into the spatial uh, strategies uh, to uh, inform investment and also into the regulations through the um, NBE plans. So it's a bit of a change from what we've got, but what we don't see in this new resource management system is where the CAA, the Climate Adaptation Act, fits in. And what I said before was from what we understand, um, again, from ministerial statements, is that that's standalone and it will um, be primarily um, related to uh, assisting communities that have in that position of needing to um, retreat from a hazard area. So if I could just the final slide, please. So just a bit of a conclusion. Um, the recent changes to the RMA, and I'm talking about that requirement to give, have regard to um, the, the national climate plans means that there's already a strong requirement for all agencies to address climate change matters um, under the RMA. We don't have to wait till the new system to do that. Um, we've already addressed um, the adaptation elements of um, climate change and the access to renewable uh, energy through the or electricity um, through the operative regional policy statement. And district plans, as well as regional plans, must give effect to the regional policy statements. So that's quite a strong uh, requirement there. But the current system doesn't give us the tools um, and the means to reverse past planning decisions that are made by a district councils. The um, allocation of um, uh, to climate influence natural resources is something that we do through the regional plan, but also we've got to look at those regional plans, um, the, the operating um, mechanism uh, is a resource consent. So that is a limited tenure and um, we can actually review uh, matters. So there is some room to adapt in the regional um, planning context, but um, 
bottom line is that we need the access to um, the finance and also or communities need access to the finance and also we need access and district councils do to to those um, provisions that will allow tricky legal um, uh, constraints to be managed for those communities that are facing faced with retreat that doesn't if what we've understood the purpose of the CAA to be, that doesn't need to be linked or dependent on a region transitioning to the new system. We should be able to access those tools now. And the previous council recognised this on the 30th of September last year, the chairman, then chairman, wrote to the Minister uh, for Climate Change requesting this be advanced as a matter of urgency. And uh, Madam Chair, I'd just like to leave it there. And if there's any um, ambiguity or questions that uh, the committee may have, happy to answer those. Thank you, Blair. Um, as committee members will likely appreciate, Blair is a wealth of knowledge on the policy space. And so um, even if you need to in future um, go back, he's a really great person to go back to and ask and really discern between the give effect to and, and have regard to and all that kind of detail that's in there. Um, and the other takeaway I had from this was, um, well, it's, it's nothing new, but it's been a uh, not so coordinated approach at reducing emission has been ineffective. And so we're actually at quite a critical point in time as this council, um, or, or as anyone at this point in time to to act and, and do what's necessary to make some changes, because we haven't pivoted yet, despite having some of the powers to do so and so I would call on any um, city, district and unitary authority councillors um, you know, and I do talk to them to to really look at future district plan reviews and, and the options that they have got available to them so um, to address especially mitigation as well. Uh, but we've got Benjamin with a question or a comment. Yeah, good day Blair. Um, yeah. The Climate Adaption Act, when do you expect it to come in and is it going to provide funding for managed retreat? Because that's a cry going on in Auckland at the moment, and obviously Coromandel and would be relevant as well. Um, or is it just going to mandate it without, is there any indication of either of those things? Um, we understood that it's timetable and we haven't heard anything different um, is for, it's expected to be tabled prior to the election, which is what, 14th of October. Um, and the second part of your question, will it contain finance? Um, we haven't seen it yet. We haven't seen a draft of it. Um, but I can say that uh, on the 10th of June 2021, I think, 21, yeah, um, Minister Shaw did make some comments at that stage saying that finance would need to be available. We've certainly seen that he, that central government have made statements that um, a combination of funding will need to be provided. Um, the minister at that time, and it was at the launch of the AIG um, 2001 um, uh, climate perception survey, uh, said that central government would have to fund make some funding available, but not every um, situation was comparable. Some were in, would find themselves in a clim at risk climate uh, area through no fault of their own, yet others within uh, the, uh, would have had some um, expectation that climate change is happening. Um, and have recently purchased in areas or recently developed in, in areas or had challenged, been, been part of a um, land use uh, change process that where climate change had been uh, uh, raised as part of the um, consenting process. So not all people were in the same boat and that finance wouldn't be universal. That's all. That's all I've heard. Thanks for the insight, Blair. I mean, I've sat around speculating about what it could be, and we really could 
you know, do that for days, but that's mm. what they, they get paid to do. So hopefully they will hurry up and put out the um, direction so that we can get on with that, um, especially in light of recent events as well. I'm sure those people would like some certainty about the future and in light of not knowing anything, we don't even know. So, um, Robbie, thanks for joining us. Nice to have you as chair of ICM along to take an interest in climate action. I know the previous chair of ICM actually joined the committee halfway through the training out of interest. So what's your question today for Blair? Huh. Yeah, after sitting in here for a couple of minutes today, I may have to. Um, when it comes to the retreat question, and I know where it's coming from, so I just want to put another question in it. Those properties that you're talking about there are at most probably the low, most low carbon use farms in New Zealand, and they're actually most probably the most fertile farms in New Zealand. All they normally apply is nitrogen and lime to farm there. So has that been taken into account when you work out um, and all those adverse effects that, that you actually may be allowing the loss of the most fertile soils in New Zealand? So from what I'm hearing, Robbie, is... Um, you're I don't know if I've worded it correctly, but what yeah. I'm saying is when you're talking about controlled retreat, you're actually saying that they, those fertile soils that are there, that are uh, low, uh, a low... Pardon? Urban I'm, yeah. I can't oh, hear. That's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That, that's why I just wanted that clarified. Yeah, that if it's if it's farmland that's very fertile and it's it, it's a low carbon farming way, mm -hmm. why would we be retreating from it? That's what the question was asking. And, and Robbie, this is um, as as Stu pointed out, this is about at the moment about urban retreat where it is simply putting people in harm's way by not even having the conversation. And we have Rick here who has worked with communities on what becomes intolerable risk. And it's only after a very long process of discussion and conversation and looking at options, do you actually even come to the point of saying what, what is retreat and how do we retreat and when do we retreat? And we have a long way to go to explore all the options, particularly in our region. Rick has been involved with um, Farikawa up on the Coromandel Peninsula, the Hauraki side there, and also um, with Waikato District. So there may be some opportunity to have that conversation when we talk about the risk assessment. Yeah, yeah. and in light of the Climate Adaptation Act not even being out, um, we just don't know how to start even. Have, well, we have started conversations in certain places, but it gets to a point where you can't go any further with it because we don't know who pays them, how much and when and how to put that into context of, of scale. So, um, but yes, very much to what um, Karen was saying, it's it's mainly about um, saving human lives um, from intolerable risk, that kind of definition, but it's still not defined. So we, we don't quite know. Yeah, but then I agree with Clyde that you must have information that we can see science and, and research to back it up because totally. even Toby is starting to push this on his ratepayers that are in the farming. So Toby, um, at, um, Adam, um, yep. yeah. And so there is, it is misty of what we're actually talking about. That's what it was. Yeah. And I think that highlights how, since this is a really sensitive topic, we've got to be really careful with how we talk about it yeah. and be really clear as to how far we can go in those conversations until this Climate Adaptation Act is out and how far we can go afterwards. Because that will give people that security. No so what was that? We don't need to scare people for no, no reason. No, no. And it is in the, um, from what has been flagged, it is only like the um, last case scenario as well. There's the whole uh, option of holding things back and adapting in the way of um, changing how, say, a house is built and so forth to to withstand and and all that's got to be taken in consideration with time scales as well because you might do those things for a certain number of decades and then the retreat might come way down the track potentially but having a mechanism is, is for those who are affected right now and don't have those other first two options would just be really helpful well it's actually interesting because i'm actually involved in one of those scenarios right now where 
a, a resident in Springdale is trying to build a house and now they're saying that it's in a prediction floodplain where water has never actually got to that property, but it's perceived that it's in an old floodplain. So now they're saying under climate change, he can't build, he may not be allowed to build there, or it might be to a certain already a predicted level of service that he has to build at, or, or the house has to be able to be removed. So there's a whole, these things are already starting to hit. Um, that's even just Madame Piaka. We're not even talking about Haraki Plains there. So um, those things are already starting to affect communities right now. Yeah, and that's that's one you could always touch base with Rick um, on outside just to to get your understanding for that particular scenario to be able to provide some um, context. Uh, uh, Stu. Well, I was going to say, Robbie, there's, there's houses in Moko, which is a little community at the bottom end of our region on our boundary with Taranaki. So now our patch, um, they were um, they were all offered um, an opportunity to relocate their houses to the other side of the road. Oh, how long ago? 30 years ago, maybe? Yeah. And uh, my understanding is most of them declined. And they've been falling into the drink there for, I oh, was as long as I've been on council, 12 years. And because they're relatively simple little inexpensive batches, um, it never hits the headlines. When it's a multi-million dollar batch in the Cook's Beach, they go bonker, you know. Um, so it's happening. And just one other thing too, the flood um, management assets run by this council are absolutely critical to those homeowners looking for insurance, for example. And what you are seeing, though, is that insurance flight, the impact on ability to get mortgages. So this isn't just a regional council issue at all, but it is one that affects all of us together. Thank you. Um, in that case, oh, Tipper, yes, please. Tipa, is your question, are there any international models that are being considered? I just saw that in the chat. In relation to um, men's so, retreat? Or? Yeah, I'd say in relation to the Climate Adaptation Act and the things they're trying to come up with, I would think. Um, Surely. Surely. We, I have heard talk on, on the radio about how they're looking at examples over in Australia and that kind of thing. This happens at all scales. I mean, we, we should be looking at um, uh, what's happening and how a climate that we're projected to move into is being managed in other jurisdictions as well. Um, additionally, in relation to the um, National Adaptation Plan, um, it is understood that both this and the emissions reduction plan will in the future be developed by the um, Climate Change Commission and the expectation is that um, new learnings will be brought into um, the uh, each subsequent edition as well as uh, understanding of international experience and we've certainly uh, see that the current um, Climate Change Commission is modelled on the um, UK Climate Change Committee, which is also required to pre prepare national climate plans, and they change quite a lot. Um, so our one has mirrored um, the uh, learnings from international experience. It, it's it, We're not alone on this, it's happening right across the planet. Um, so international expertise is something that we really need to um, embrace and to make our own such that it fits our own circumstances, but also um, notwithstanding that, as uh, Councillor Mahuta mentioned earlier, Indigenous knowledge, mātauranga, um, would be a vital input into an understanding of longevity, what's happened in the past, as well, so that we can build on that and, and take things in the future. Um, one of the, the uncertainties of this work is, and it sort of came up earlier on about the evidence base, it's really easy to have an evidence base of empirical monitored information. It's the equivalent of hindsight. 
and with hindsight you can make perfect decisions but we don't have that and we've we're entering a as the ipcc um mentioned a climate that we've um that is new to us and all our culture our infrastructure our cities our agriculture is based on the climate that we've left so we, we need to understand how to use models in our um, future allocation of space of land and access to resources which is not easy thank you blair um i was just going to ask mike um, scarsbrook to also make a comment because i saw his um, note there in the chat are you there mike would you uh, like to? yeah thanks thanks chair um I just wanted to comment. Um, Tipper had a uh, question in the chat about uh, whether we're looking at international models, and um, I guess when when we were developing the sustainable infrastructure decision making framework, we undertook uh, uh, some case studies of work done elsewhere, um, and one of those was around the um, Room for the River program in the Netherlands. Obviously, they've they had. Um, sort of catastrophic flooding um, several decades ago and uh, as a result um, implemented some significant changes to how they manage their floodplains and, and lowland areas, obviously getting to the point where they could no longer build their dikes any higher or their flood defences any higher. They've started uh, re-engineering their floodplain systems to uh, essentially make more room for the river, spread the flood uh, peaks out and um, yeah, so so to Tipper's question, yes, we have looked at some of that international um, international information and knowledge. Kia ora. Thank you. Yeah, I've heard that um, the Netherlands program is really, really um, quite incredible, actually. So great to hear that you're looking at that. Um, and I think for for um, kind of summing up here, or saying that we're starting to really feel the impacts because we've known about a lot of this already, but we haven't had the conversations, but they are now starting to happen. And so hence we've got to uh, get ourselves ready to to have those conversations, to not talk about it and to kick it down the road would be the worst thing to do. Um, even though some of those conversations are sensitive and difficult, um, but we do need that central government direction. Um, doesn't just, look like, we've, just oh, to pick Benjamin, up on, yep. on Blair's point about we're looking forward for things that we haven't seen before. I noticed today they were talking in Gisborne about 77 mils of rain in two hours, which is the heaviest they've ever had. So it's like a more intense rainfall, which we haven't we haven't planned for in the past. Yeah, that's right. More frequent and more intense. Um, that's kind of how it's, how it's looking. Um, and seeing records hit on um, heat as well as floods, as well as intensity of rain. Okay, in that case, um, Pamela, do you want to move to receive? And I'll second. All those in favour, please say aye. Carried. Thank you all. Then um, we can move on to item eight, which is the um, Waikato Regional Council Climate Action Roadmap, our climate commitments and policies, overview and update, which will be led by Karen. Um, and this is kind of the, the more um, substantial item in this agenda. So it's great that, Mike, you can be a part of the start of it. I know you do have to leave at some stage in the near future. Okay, go Thank for it, you. Karen. Thank you very much. Yeah, so this is a paper just um, apprising you of a proposal to review and update the Climate Action Roadmap that was approved in 2020. A lot has happened since then. Um, we've had legislative changes. We've got national climate plans and updated climate science projections. We have a body of knowledge and also a body of activity and staff developing and growing in their understanding and response capacity. So the roadmap was um, an evidence-based document with regional council roles, functions and activities mapped to nine pathways. The implementation of this roadmap is guided by, as we've referred to, the Climate Action Roadmap Advisory Group and a number of the team online and also in the room with you here today. Section managers, managers, team leaders, project managers, and the subject matter experts. We have an implementation work plan, which keeps us on track, and we report to this committee using that implementation plan. 
pass the slide please. I'll just give you a brief outline of the review and the areas it'll cover. Okay, so we will look at incorporating the changes in the operating environment, the feedback we've had from our own staff, from experts, subject matter experts, from our stakeholders, and the learning since publication in 2020. We'll integrate the new strategy that Council has been working on and will be adopting, we trust, at the end of the March. We will be looking at the themes and the targets and actions, and we'll be taking a multi-generational time frame to update this, this roadmap. To your right, there's the diagram, the spheres of influence, and we talked about this while we were developing the strategic direction. The parts, the roles that the council can play in any function or any given activity. We can lead or provide, we can be the funder, we can um, be a partner, or we can be the convener or facilitator of activities or bringing people together. We advocate, and as we said in the paper that we're going to put to strategy and policy tomorrow, huge program of advocacy, and we are the regulator. So using those spheres of influence, we'll map our response and commitments to each of those response areas. We'll incorporate references to our key work programs to help achieve each of these pathways. And also significantly, we'll be incorporating the implications of the National Adaptation Plan and the Emissions Reduction Plan into each of those pathways. And crucially, because it's not over till it's funded, the updates will assist staff with the long term plan development and the proposals they will be bringing or we will be bringing to councillors. Slide please. So here are the roadmap pathways as they sit now. There are the nine of them there. Just draw your attention to the adaptation and the mitigation on the right hand side there at that 25% emissions reduction by 2030 on the road to net zero by 2050. That was a community driven target set. Sorry. That's right. <laughs> set just before we actually had the legislation setting New Zealand's nationally determined contributions and it probably definitely needs to be reviewed and we will review that and align it to national direction. So currently we're looking at the roadmap pathways and we're proposing that coastal resilience is actually expanded to become regional resilience. That's consistent with the direction we've been receiving from councillors as they've been discussing their strategic direction. So that will have an expansion won't just be coastal, it'll be focusing more on regional and resilience as a whole. And there's one saying that um, comes to mind often, and that's that vulnerability predisposes people to disaster. So an area of focus for resilience is obviously about the vulnerability in our communities and understanding how do we actually shore up that social resilience as well. Agriculture and soils, becomes agriculture, forestry and soils. And this will be updated to note the changes from Haywaka Ekonoa, that's the government and the primary sector partnership addressing climate change and mitigation. We're proposing that we incorporate the forestry aspect of the habitat restoration pathway in, in here. And we will also include biosecurity threats to our region's agricultural base. And this will have the habitat restoration and carbon sequestration. And it allows us to look at that landscape scale planting program and how that might work. And we did have some discussion about those mosaic plantings where we can have right tree, right place, and still have our pastoral agriculture and other forms of primary production. Water is life. Um, this will incorporate the water quality aspects of the habitat rest restoration pathway. So it will 
still be focusing on the same issues that were there, identified through our water strategy some time ago, but we'll also bring in the restoration. Uh, transport, we will expand to be transport and urban development. Again, consistent with councillors' direction to us that it's all very well just to talk about our buses and our trains, but more importantly, is that urban form and working with our territorial authorities on urban form. Sustainable investment becomes sustainable investment and funding, and that's to encourage discretionary funds to be able to deliver to outcomes sought for climate response as well. And then the biodiversity and biosecurity. Staff are still debating at this stage the best way to handle this pathway, whether we merge and streamline biodiversity and habitat restoration into one pathway or separate out biosecurity from biodiversity or integrate across all the pathways so that there is this um, element of recognizing the importance of biodiversity in everything we do. Biosecurity, we believe we should pull out and provide a bit more context in terms of threats and opportunities. Um, all the surveys we've seen of recent years, it still is treated as an absolute number one risk for our primary sector. And it's always put front and center of the agenda when we see the, the primary, um, the agenda coming forward, particularly those KPMG agendas that put through it field days. And interested in your feedback on the current pathway for drainage and um, flood management, should this continue as its own pathway or does that become part of the regional resilience pathway and respond there in a more integrated, holistic fashion? And the energy pathway, that's uh, continuing as it is, recognizing that central government is proposing a national renewable energy strategy very soon. And I don't actually have the date there, but maybe Leah has that top of mind. Um, just on that one, the date, uh, my understanding was mid next year. And there's certainly been uh, voices from a number of areas to, for the government to uh, speed that up. Um, that's all I've heard. And just, um, we'll stay on that slide, but just to give you a sense of timing, staff review is underway now, looking at all these pathways and also updating current operating environments so that we can see what our responses should be to those. Uh, proposing a council workshop in April and then bringing the revised draft of the roadmap to this committee on the 30th of May. Feedback and endorsement. I just thanks for that, Karen. And just note, um, welcome to the table, Lisa Armstrong, author of our paper. And just in case we have detailed questions, we'll direct them to her as well. Um, does anybody have anything to start us off? Go, Stu. I was just thinking on the um, the drainage and flood management one, and um, the term and extent of which current infrastructure and flood protection schemes are fit for purpose. And it's interesting what the purpose is, because we all know that, um, as we've seen in the last month, um, I mean, the purpose of a, of a dwelling, a personal dwelling, is to somewhere to live that's safe. And, and obviously, um, they've been cited in places that clearly aren't fit for purpose. Um, whereas flood and drainage management, um, from a, an ag perspective, we have an agreed level of service, three days of, of monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. That's a purpose that, that we agree on with the, with the beneficiaries. Um, that that level of service may well change um, as as climate change becomes, the impacts become greater. And and again, we just have that. It's all about that conversation that that we have with the the beneficiaries in terms of what that level of service um, is, because we we can't provide a level of service that protects um, beneficiaries from from um, biblical events isn't the right word, but 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 more extreme events, you know. So just making sure that wording we use um, 
Roger that, if that makes sense. Anyone else? Robbie? Um, sure. Just in the flood protection thing, the, the, it becomes a mitigating factor for um, habitation as well, though, doesn't it? In, in that sense? So uh, they're quite linked to mitigation yeah, and adaptation. Yeah, yeah. 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 So yeah. in that, flood protection becomes a. Um, a mitigating factor to resolve safety around those issues as well. Um, I can share some. Uh, I really like the sound of the regional resilience aspect. I think there's resilience strategies required for a whole lot of things. Um, I'm mindful that in the past Actually, no, I'll start somewhere else. I'll say um, I've had really good feedback from stakeholders when the Climate Action Roadmap came out. Uh, the only uh, constructive feedback otherwise I've had is that it's it was very much written with our sphere of influence in mind. It was written as a Waikato Regional Council, this is what we're up to kind of kind of thing, or this is what we're up to and we'd like to partner with you on it kind of thing. And so their feedback was, and I think this um, hacks back to um, that we're providing strategic direction and leadership um, for the region as a whole. They want to see more of that. And so my feedback would be that we consider the pathways to evolve and mature into a more holistic sense so that any topic can pretty much be partnered on, even if it is just us being a convener or, or us pointing out that that's something that needs work on, and even if it's not in our um, you know, our specific uh, influence directly in that sense. And so one category for that, for example, to some degree would be, I'd love to see a focus on um, material use um, and levels of consumption and uh, focus on, you know, some people consume more than others. So th that whole aspect, you might have come across it before, but richer people in our society consume a lot more products <laughs> than poorer people. And so the carbon footprint um, is actually quite different for, for them than for others. And so while it is everyone's responsibility, it is not something to be shouldered equally by everyone. Um, and so the materials or, or whatever other word, um, a circular economy, bioeconomy type of directions that we would go down there um, is, is something where we do have some expertise. Uh, we have um, our waste minimization work that we've done in the past and that we still provide strategic leadership to the region on um, that would easily fall under this category as well. Um, but ultimately it it is about living well with an environmental limits and, and acknowledging that consumption of materials as part of that. It's a very core part of um, the root cause for both climate change and the um, biodiversity stuff I mentioned before. Uh, I do love the regional resilience piece. Um, what I was going to mention there was I've seen how Wellington has really been leading in uh, Wellington City Councils just said they're doing a, a city's food future action plan. In the past in agriculture, we've mainly focused on industry and, and hiwaka ekanoa, but there is a piece for us in resilience about, and we can see it with supply chain issues and um, how supermarkets now hear yeah, prices fluctuating wildly and so forth, that there does need to be a piece of work in there about resilience for food. Um, energy, we've, we've just touched on before, um, but I believe that needs to be expanded to include um, not just increasing renewable energy, and some councillors have heard me say this before, but also that promotion of active reduction of fossil fuel use, as well as efficiency and, and that kind of thing. Uh, the other one around, actually, I, th I thought as well in the agriculture one and talking about food, uh, we've, we haven't really touched on so often, but I see it popping up now and with a lot more talk on aquaculture, that there's the farming of the land and then there's the farming of the sea. And so um, finding a place for that to sit somewhere in the pathways would be really appreciated so that it does have a, a anchor point. And on coastal 
um, resilience and the flood protection piece. It's whether you're at the coast or inland, the conversation that we have to have is around um, communities determining for themselves what they want their communities to look like in future. So um, I think that comes through in that regional resilience aspect. But would, and on your question on around the flood protection and drainage, I see the drainage piece being quite separate at times to the flood protection. And so if the flood protection was more to go into that community self-determination and other pieces, then the drainage could be looked at um, as a subset, since that is a, a service that we are doing on behalf of landowners, and there's another conversation to have about that. Uh, but otherwise, I really like all the other things that were mentioned. Thank you. Pamela. Thank you. Um, I, I suppose that just uh, in listening to the um, corridor around this, I, I think that it's it's great that we're continuing to look at this and and uh, adapt it. Gosh, we're going to use that word a lot, aren't we? I mean, lately, yeah. we were just, we were just <laughs> um, to uh, to not only the the changing environment, literally, uh, but also uh, reflecting. Our, uh, what our communities are calling for right now. And, and I guess I just want to raise that a lot of our communities right now are quite concerned about uh, cost of living crisis, right? Totally. And and we just, uh, not too many weeks ago, had our, our own conversation in this uh, council chamber around our annual plan and, uh, you know, going from a 1.6 rate increase in our pro projected in our LTP to well, where we ended up, which was 5.8. And and wanting to ensure that that was cognizant of what uh, of the affordability piece in our communities, and so I guess I just want to raise the the issue of making sure that we as a council are cognizant of what are our conversations to lead lead and what are national conversations to lead, because for us to be a convener, while it might seem uh, appropriate given the the scope of our coverage as an organization, uh, anytime we convene, it costs, right? And so we need to make sure that we are the right convener, uh, that that we are cognizant of the, the stuff we must do, and stuff is a bit, dis I shouldn't say stuff, uh, the um, the tasks that we are legislated to do, um, the the real core business of this council and making sure we do that in the most effic uh, efficient and effective, cost effective in particular manner uh, and not put our hand up to have or lead or convene conversations that are actually somebody else's to, um, to lead. And, uh, and when we volunteer to lead them, we volunteer our ratepayers to pay for that. So it's, that'd be my comment. That's really well said, Pamela. And I think that should go throughout, really, because um, it's something to be so cognizant of. And, and I suppose oh, I used the word convener before, but a lot of the time it's partner, and a lot of the time it's advocate, ad, like yeah, advocating for that, having a stance in the first place so that when it comes up, we whip it out and... <laughs> and put it forward yet again um, on those many consultations that are coming. Well, and ensuring we include those perspectives when we put forward a submission on these things, yeah. that's that's a really good place for us to be able to influence at that national level, if that's the level we feel that that's conversation right. needs to be led from. That's right. Yeah. No, I love that. Okay. Just uh, to pick Benjamin. up on Pamela's point, um, that when we're assessing these, we assess them in terms of the four well-beings and that economy is considered as well as everything else. Because if you've got a project that is great for climate change but loses money continuously and costs mm -hmm. a lot of, you know, it's not sensible in a current environment. Yeah, no, totally. And it actually brought up for me as my, in my mind um, this concept of just transitions and where, um, whether that's throughout, and probably is, or whether we, um, or how we figure out how to have those conversations to, to get that right. Awesome. Any other thoughts online? No. Um, I, I think I had a question, and that was just uh, for me. It was since we're maturing in this, 
another aspect to mature would be um, that mataranga and and um, te ao Māori worldview being represented in the in the layout and content of our next roadmap. But but I think um, and just getting that indigenous lens on it so that it makes sense to all of our community and and that type of thing. Um, on that then, um, I think we can just agree it's a good time to review this document in light of where we are in the training so that we can have um, a good overview as we had last time of the kind of direction of travel and the likely things and how everything interconnects. Oh, Pamela, just wanted to get. I, I see the the staff recommendation. Just wanted to get some clarity on on what that what point two means. So we're endorsing the proposal to update the roadmap and 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 the rest of that. So does that then come back to this committee for us to see again? I guess indeed it does. And you'll workshop yeah. it in April. Great. And I, we did want to call it out specifically because we currently have maybe six or seven different council policies mm -hmm. sitting in various parts mm -hmm. of the organisation. We thought it made sense for all of us here, but also for our stakeholders to see it as a single statement. Great. Thank you. Yeah, it'll make life easier. No, thanks for clarifying that. So, so, um, yes, yeah, so I understand next one's a workshop to do the fine tuning, and then it will come to us in the next climate action meeting in the next few months. All right. Um, in that case, just we'll, a question. Yeah. Um, should we have in there reference to um, in the context of the four well beings into this, you know, update the proposal to update the ash, the map? Does that fit in there, or is that something we do at the workshop? My my thoughts are that it's it's implied because the context of the four well beings is always in that purpose for local government. So you could put it in almost any uh, resolution. But Karen, your thoughts since these. Um, well, I was going to echo that it is the purpose of local government, but also you've given us very clear direction through your strategic direction. Right. And I think um, it's the four well-beings that we're addressing through this work. Yep. So it is front of mind. Thank you. It's quite a, there's a, there's a, a lot of inherent tensions in this work too, as you well know, because um, sometimes you have to spend a bit of money early to offset a potential cost that could come our way in 10 years down the track. And that, that's quite a challenging thing to decide whether it's good value for money or not, as you all know. So, but yeah, I, I agree that it's, it's well integrated into those different actions. Yeah. yeah, we'll definitely touch on that again. But it is a central government $12 million thing, billion, thankfully not ours. Um, but it is ultimately all of ours through that decision. Uh, would I have a mover? Thank you, Stu. Seconder in Benjamin. Thank you. Then um, all those in favour, please say aye. Okay. Aye. Yes. Carried. Cool. Thank you all. In that case, uh, we're doing well on time. Uh, does pick, can people let me know if they need a five minute break? Otherwise, we'll just carry on. You got you look pretty comfortable and we're doing well, so all right then. Yeah, sneak it in individually. All right, so then we will go on to item nine. Yes, Stu. William, if I if I jump onto Teams here, so on this, um making a cup of tea, I can hear what's going on. It that should. doesn't interfere anything as when well, I've got it open on here at the same time, does it? No, it shouldn't. Yeah, yeah. I found you couldn't turn it off completely, it still seemed to have a tiny little bit of noise here, but on the phone. Good luck, Stu. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll go on to item nine, which is update of phase two of the Waka Regional Climate Change Risk Assessment. And for that, we've got Lisa and Rick lifting. Hello. Uh, I look forward to hearing where you're up to, but I have read the paper and I understand the complication of having a lot of experts pulled away when these events are actually happening over the last few weeks. So go for it. Tell us what you need to tell us. If there's anything to highlight on top of the report we've read. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, kia ora koutou, Madam Chair and Councillors. Um, really just an opportunity to update you on where we're at with this work. Uh, so over the final quarter of 2022, we 
fo we're focused on developing and testing the scope and approach for phase two of our climate change risk assessment. And over February and March, we were intending to be carrying out um, detailed risk ratings and focus groups with subject matter experts and also working with Iwi Māori on co-designing um, how we assess risk for, for our Waikato iwi. Um, of course, we had been progressing into plan, but the impact of the ongoing weather events has had significant implications on capacity for staff and stakeholders to contribute in particular to project work. So recognising this, we have actually um, taken steps to revise our plan for delivery of the climate change risk assessment, allowing for staggered delivery of the assessment, and because we recognise that this work, you know, in terms of understanding our climate risk exposure for both acute and chronic climate hazards is really important for both the resilience and wellbeing of our region. So for March, we've um, taken the decision based on staff capacity to focus on the net risks to the natural environment. And then once the immediate response to the um, recent weather events are over, we will focus on, you know, continuing our work on the um, on assessing risks in particular to the built environment. So I am very happy to say that tomorrow we're holding our very first um, risk assessment, assessment focus group with subject matter experts um, from the coastal and marine environment area. So we'll be assessing risks to um, ecology and, and various other risk elements. So that's taking place tomorrow. So I'm really happy to be able to kick off that and um, continue on with at least the natural environment. So what else can I add? It's probably, um, yeah, so we're planning between now and the May Climate Action Committee, we we'll hope to have advanced um, the natural environment risk assessment and also had the opportunity to work with staff to revise our general plan for how we deliver the remaining um, components of the risk assessment. And then also have talked to iwi on how we work with iwi on climate change and also how we approach um, analysis of the social and economic risks arising from those direct risks to our region. And unless there's any questions immediately on what I've just spoken about, I could perhaps hand to Rick to talk about um, some of the work he has been involved in responding to the weather events and the implications that it has had on our on capacity and delivery. Okay, we'll come to Rick in a sec. Um, I see Warren's got his light on. Go for it. Uh, thank you through you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, Lisa, just just a quick outline on on that, uh, just the coastal piece you just mentioned there, and and what you're actually looking at um, with the risk side of it. Are, are you looking at the risk from from inundation and that side of things so to to uh, structures on land, or you, you mentioned ecology? So I just yeah, at, at this stage, it's focusing on risks to the natural environment. So. Uh, Help me out if you want to think, throw in a few examples, but definitely ecology, species, species ecosystems. Just trying to think um, of our oh, giant so, species. So marine ecology or, or land-based ecology? Uh, both of so that. I, you, I, do you want to talk about the, yeah, well, the zone that it's covered, Rick? I'll just okay. get you to come close enough to the mic, Rick. Sure. Um, so it's, it's definitely, you know, it's the coastal environment. So that includes your, um, your, you know, your, biodiversity that's offshore and also in that coastal fringe as well. So we're talking about the, you know, your, your mangrove areas, your, your dune areas as well, which are quite important um, areas of, of biodiversity. And what will that happen in the future with, uh, with projected increases in sea level rise and also temperature as well? So it does include that, that coastal fringe as well as the offshore um, species as well. Yeah. So it won't at this stage address the, the the risk to the built environment from coastal inundation, but that will be. I mean, we recognise that's vitally important to cover, but that, that will come. Yep. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, Rick, do you want to tell us a little bit more? Um, if someone could stop it raining, that would be really helpful. So just I bet. putting it out there. So it has been a very... <laughs> great. <laughs> I, I know this council can do a lot, so that'll be very much appreciated. Uh, so, look, it has been, I, I keep on using the word unprecedented 
um, and it's unprecedented until, unprecedented until the next one. And that's mm -hmm. what we've had over the last uh, probably three months since about November, where we, we've had successive events that have just compounded the next one. And I think that's something that we um, we have not seen before. And again, we use that word un unprecedented. So we have over the years mentioned that ooh, we've missed, we've dodged the bullet uh, on a numerous uh, uh, events. And this time we did get hit. We did get a bullet. Um, we got quite a big bullet in some of our areas. Um, but if you liken the Gisborne and Hawke's Bay area, they got a bomb. Uh, and so again, while we were hit, it could have been much worse. And the latest NIWA advice is that um, between now and the end of the cyclone season, we could potentially see another three or five cyclones coming down our way. And in fact, if you look at the, the forecast at the moment, there's actually two that are tracking southwards, but luckily to the east of us, so it's unlikely it will be impacted. But we don't know what's going to come out um, at the other end uh, over this, this next few while. So uh, in terms of WRC's role, we are um, quite integral in terms of providing the so what, what, you know, what does it mean when we get 200 millimetres of rainfall in over 48 hours? What does that mean to our catchments, our rivers, our infrastructure? So we provide that information, that intel, through to civil defence and our partner agencies to provide them with some really good go forward around how they are to best plan with their communities around the what ifs. And uh, particularly with our flood uh, protection schemes and land drainage schemes is, you know, what is the likelihood of say, uh, and, and which did happen is the Karonga spillway, one of our key flood protection schemes um, in Thames, uh, whether that is going to go over and which it's, it's designed to do, go over State Highway 25 and close State Highway 25. So that's the type of information we have, how often or when State Highway 2 through the Karangahake Gorge is going to close. Um, one, uh, and also uh, State Highway 26 uh, in Paroa, where and we had our floodgates operate for the first time and brand new floodgates, which um, worked very, very well and mm -hmm. saved um, normally, I think previously with the stop logs, it took uh, three to four hours to put up in sections like Lego blocks across that gap in the stop bank, whereas this time it took half an hour. Uh, and also the, the the savings we have uh, or the you know, the increases and in, in safety to our, our team is putting up those structures as well. So we've learned quite a lot from this event. Um, we've also learned a lot from, and we'll still learn a lot from the events that have, um, have impacted the Hawke's Bay and Gisborne era as well. Uh, just a little bit of FYI or information um, is, the stop banks or the flood protection that Hawke's Bay had, so their stop banks, um, all of their 100 year stop banks and some of their, well, their new 500 year stop banks were overwhelmed. So the water rose over top of that. And if you think about when you design these flood protection schemes that you design to a, a particular design flood level, i.e. your 100 year event, you also have a, a component of freeboard on top as well. So it overtopped with the freeboard. So again, that's a significant event and it's something that we need to think about in terms of our future resilience of our communities is what is that tolerance level? How often do our communities deal with these types of events? And that directly is related to how we design our flood protection, how we work with communities around what is acceptable tolerable or intolerable risk. Um, and unfortunately, you know, some people have um, experienced that firsthand, and it's really important now that we build on that awareness for our communities to build in that resilience going forward. Hence, understanding the potential impacts of climate change and what new risks that will bring us and, and based on the current risks that we, ha we have now. Thank you, Rick. Have any further questions, Robbie? I just totally agree with everything you said, then, Rick. Really, um, and it's I know it's sad, but for us, there's some flood infrastructure that hasn't actually seen a flood since the 80s, and our communities are finally seeing why those assets were put there to start off with. So we may get a bit of buyback back from communities why they are actually there, which has been a I know it's a sad thing to have to say, but realization that 
spiral wouldn't survive without a stock bank around it. People don't understand that. When I was campaigning down there, they go, what do we want stock banks for? Well, you can naturally see why you have them now. Um, and I think the community is in a great understanding that these things are of natural, um, national significance and they're very important structures and, you know, our communities wouldn't be there without them. And that's why they were invested heavily in the 80, or late 70s and 80s to be there. So, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, we'll go to, I was going to say Benjamin, but I'll go Warren because he's got the light. I'm sure he'll be forgiven. <laughs> Thank you, through you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I, and stop me if it's not the right time, but I know you, we briefly mentioned um, Kiowa and uh, Porikawa Coast and, and your input there. Um, are you able at this time, and if not, happy to take it offline, but um, just a quick outline on, on the, the initial feedback you've had from residents in that area? Yeah, through the chair, just, um, very quickly, it's, it's been very positive. Um, and but the the real success is because we have been able to work really closely with the community from the get go. Um, we've had a very very um, positive community panel that we work very closely with with, and they were actually the the main engagement method with the rest of the community. Um, if we didn't have that structure and have that trust with them, um, then it may have been a different story. And that's a really good learning for for the future work that we're doing in that, in that space. But it's been um, a very, very positive outcome. Still a lot more work to be done uh, in implementing this, and there's still a way to go on that, but it, it's, yeah, we're very happy with that outcome. Yeah, and I think the community are as well. Um, it's now up to councils, um, both Haraki, uh, Waikato District Council and Regional Council to keep the ball rolling. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for that. And Robbie, can I get you to turn the, your light off? Oh, All good. You go, Benjamin. All right, just checking, um, as a result of the flood response, are there any stock banks that you currently need improvement or raising? I mean, is there any you are starting to identify where the investment case is coming back for? That's a really good question. So obviously, well, we didn't have any stock banks. Um, well, we have different levels of service of stock banks. So uh, again, we our, our, our highest level of service is your 100 year, and then we have um, cascading down lower levels of service. So, for instance, the car, the Kaoranga spillway, which is effectively a stop bank, but it's designed to be overtopped as a five-year return interval type of event. Um, so, uh, nothing that has come towards where you know we were getting close to being overwhelmed, and so we were quite lucky in that in that respect. We have been close in other years. On the 2018 storm surge event, that got up to the design flood level. Luckily, we had a little bit of freeboard on top of that. Um, but we got close. So again, it's those discussions around while we have survived this one, is what does the future hold for us? And what do we need to do and work with our communities to understand how we re retain and remain resilient? And is that increasing stock banks? Or is that some other, there is a, some other mechanism where we can try to reduce the flows coming through our systems as well? Great discussions to be had. Um, yeah, and, and but understanding where um, how the system works is quite integral and how that system may change into the future. Very good evidence base to then build on, okay, well, how can we manage those those impacts going forward? And you mentioned before the well-beings, taking all that into account as well, and that's where um, our sustainable infrastructure decision-making framework um, can be utilised to understand that better, um, as well as you know, obviously the, the community engagement work that's um, has been done and is, is um, being put forward by a number of our TAs to ask those questions. So that'll be next six months, or when will they come back with proposals or ideas of what might need? To well, again, it, it's it's um, it, it's a large bit of work where we need to understand the community values. You know, what how what is their their, their risk thresholds going forward? So we have been working with Farakawa Coast. There are, there's no flood protection schemes in that area. We are working with, uh, and uh, Haraki District Council are leading a community adaptation plan for the Haraki Plains, which we'll be working very closely with. And that's going to be a multi-year project where we go through, and we understand the system, we understand the, the 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 values that the community holds dear, the economic values, you know, the agriculture, the social, the 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 the, the, the cultural as well. And how will they change or likely to change with our changing climate? And how do we adapt to those changes while maintaining 
those values that we hold dear with that community. So it's a long process. And could I just, um, through you, Madam Chair, also just add that, you know, in the context of we've also got the RM reforms coming through, which obviously the Climate Adaptation Act will be prompting those big, you know, discussions and decisions about, you know, where should people be living? And then likewise, in terms of future development, we've got the regional spatial strategies that will actually prevent, you know, will help guide decision, decisions in terms of where we develop in the future so that we're not necessarily developing in areas that are, you know, at risk of flood. Okay, we'll go to Tipper. Yeah, Tipper, online. Yes, so again, um, thank you, thank you for the report. Just a couple of questions. Um, in terms of where we're going to be most helpful, I guess, from our regional perspective, are you satisfied that we're capturing the kind of data that uh, will help with planning um, for resilience, et cetera, uh, insurance, land values, total acreage, effective potential. Are we doing any modelling like that for the future so that we can inform the conversation that will be had in policy? Was this all part of that as well? Uh, it, it's all part of the mix, definitely. You know, when we talk about making decisions, we need to make informed decisions. And you know, there's one thing to understand what the physical changes might be, but it's how those physical changes impact exactly what you've just been talking about in terms of how much land, what economic cost does that have, um, cultural, social cost as well. So we need to bring that all into the mix. It's not just a science technical, there's a lot of social science comes into these um, into these projects as well, which is really, really important. Yeah, and I, I just wonder whether without saying that we do, as Pamela noted, more than that's required, if we're going to be the source of truth for some of this planning in the future, I just want to satisfy myself that we're capturing all, you know, all the right data at a local level to advance for our, our regional resilience. So that's one, but I, I understand the process that you've got us okay. doing. Just in terms of the timing um, for this program of work, building in all the weather, um, and other dependencies that we've been suffering. Is there any other thing that would stop us delivering the reports later this year? That on page six, I think I am. It's an old report, but it was the, the stage two approach. One, nope. Uh, th report. Th through you, Madam Chair. I hope not. So, okay. <laughs> yeah. But, but I mean, there's no, you've got enough internal resource subject to all of those other catastrophes that happen. That's probably my question. We want to be successful. Yeah. So yeah. that's something that we need to work through once staff are, are back on deck, actually, thinking, okay, yeah, so what, what resource do we need to you, deliver this yeah. if, if we've got further weather events? Yeah, which yeah. is a question for Rick to work through because he's one of my main resources. <laughs> no, that's all right. We don't want to stress out. Our team that's I'm trying to build as some more resilience for our team to be able to do this well. So noting that you may have to come back at any time and revise it with us. So Kilda, and last one, um, how are we doing the UE Māori engagement? Because another series of hui, I don't think we could. We've been hui'd out while everybody is still trying to help areas like the Port Ragland, Coromandel. Um, just saying, there, but I know of six Māori who are actively in there. Uh, what do you call it, active retreat mode? Uh, are we doing stuff like that to learn from or what's the, our how? I know we want to do it, but how are we doing it? you want to talk about it? Um, yeah, so uh, that's a very good question. Now, we have been um, having some hui with, uh, you know, with at different levels. Um, you know, we've been talking to uh, Te, te Puaha, and they're doing some great work there in the, in the lower Waikato, and we we'll hope to strengthen those um, those relationships there as well. We have, over the years, been talking with uh, Te Kopu and Marae, uh, and also some other Marae as well, um, to understand what those you know what those issues might be going forward. But definitely, we need to keep that communication working and going. Um, you mentioned six Marae that are looking at actively uh, retreating. I'll be in interested to know where they are. That's that's a new one on me, to be quite honest. So. You know, Marakopa um, Kasia, Marakopa Marae, Marakopa River at the edge there, um, Makitu 
Te Koraha and others are all talking about the impacts on them. Te Koraha and Taharo. Well, we can have this offline, but there are a number. That, that'd be great if we can talk about those. Yeah. And I know we have provided some input to, to those conversations, but yeah, I think we would like to enhance that further. Thank you. That, um, Karen or Tutuhanga, would you like to comment anything else on the question? In context, the last question or in general? Thank you, Chair. And I was just seeing if Tutahanga wanted to comment because he has been supporting, leading this work for us in engaging with um, iwi partners and particularly at place, at local marae. And so I just wondered if he was there, but maybe he's left us for now. So, yeah, we are working with our partners. Oh, has he? Lovely. Tutahanga, I'll hand over to you. Thank you. Oh, kia ora, Madam Chair. Um, I, I'm, I'm just endorsing what Rick has said. A number of those sort of conversations with individual uh, areas have, have occurred. Um, but what we want to strengthen is our overall vision of how we address climate change adaptation in particular and risk identification with, with all our iwi partners. Um, so that's the process we're in at the moment. Thanks, Tatanga. Kia ora. Then, um, another, I suppose for me, it was kind of, Tipa touched on it already, it was, um, as we're at that point now, where with these events happening that are pulling personnel out, you having a think, Karen, about how to, Kind of address that for future? We're definitely having a conversation amongst ourselves about how do we protect our responders from also having to be our planners in a way? How, how do we separate those tasks so that they're not torn every which way? And then we can have greater confidence that when we have a project plan, we'll be able to continue with the project while the team are off responding, saving lives and property and environment, things like that. So it's definitely an active conversation. Yeah. Okay. No, and I appreciate the approach to to take a, a, a bite of the next piece while waiting for that to be able to come into play again. Uh, Robbie, yeah, you had another Just, question. That, that's a really hard, that's a really hard place for you to be, Rick, because I've, I've mm -hmm. been out in the community talking to some of the staff and we can't actually just chuck someone else in to help them out. So then they have time to do other things because under our health and safety policy, staff from here can't actually go and help those guys on the ground anyway, what they're doing at that time. So I totally understand the, the tough spot you've been put in at the moment because that staff is just has to stick there and can't go anywhere else. They can't help anyone at the moment because no one else can help them under our health and safety policy. They just that, That's been one thing that's come out of it is that staff actually need someone that can meet their criteria to come and help and fill in at times in the sort of incident we're in at the moment. Guys that are on the ground like Kenny and I mm -hmm. imagine um, Emily and things like that, that when they're stuck there and they want to help you out, they can't because they're just stuck there on the ground. Yeah, thank you. For the chair, just so just on that, it's, health and safety is one thing obviously, but it's also just the experience and the in-house uh, knowledge that, you know, some key personal, uh, you know, personnel hold and and how do we bring the next, you know, the, the, the next generation up? And it's that um, um, succession planning that should, that should be really, really important, having some good depth and key roles. Yeah, I imagine it could easily affect many other pieces of work also. So um, I imagine we'll touch on that in the Risk and Assurance Committee um, as well for the whole organisation and its projects. Um, in that case, I will move that we receive. Clyde, are you happy to receive the report as seconder? Awesome. Then um, all those in favour, please say aye. Have against? <laughs> Carried. All right. Thank you, Rick and Lisa and Karen for that item. Then uh, we're just on to our last item, which is the um, Toy 2 Carbon right. Reduce Program Audit and Recertification. So this is the results of our sixth audit of our in-house corporate commissions. And we're maturing in that too. 
Yeah, so we've got Lisa for that. Awesome. Uh, there was a, a fair bit in the report already. Um, clearly keen to take it as read, but um, is there any kind of key message you wanted to get across just so it's front of our mind now after having read it? Uh, well, William, if you could, Madam, through you, Madam Chair, William, if you could perhaps just move to the next slide. Yeah. One? Oh no, that that one. Yeah, so I could I could just uh, yep, note that note one. back back please. Back, back one. Back a slide. Yeah. yeah, all I could, all I could add really to the report is that since I wrote the report and submitted it for the agenda, we have since received our certification from Twitter. So that's um, it up there with um, the various documents that sit behind it. And I mean. Unless you'd like me to cover the report in a bit more detail, I can just take questions. And I um, do have a slide that sort of sets out the um, various consumption levels and monetary values associated with um, yeah, we might as our well program. Go if there is any interest in hearing some of that information. It's a good background slide to have anyway for our. Uh, which one's that? The next one? Oh, so it's not the next one, but the one after. Okay. It's with. That one? Yes, thank you. Okay. What did you want to comment on this one? You might have to just get us up to speed with this slide. Yeah, so this is really just setting out our consumption over the last six years and also just the costings associated with that. So it's really, I think, in part demonstrating the general downward trajectory of all of our um, our key emission sources, just as a general trend, and then also just you know, when you're actually saving emission, um, you know, reducing emissions, you're actually often also saving money as well. So, you know, there's a, a mutual, a double benefit to this program of work. So I don't need to go into the detail of that, but it's just really setting out the trend. And um, probably one thing, I mean, as Rick mentioned, you know, could we make it stop raining? Because as um, with the rain and the flood response, our pumps are busily pumping away and which they need to do to preserve life and farmland but are also um, rocketing up our emissions so just for um as as just to foreshadow what will be coming next year already for the last um, six months of this financial year we've already surpassed um, our emissions or electricity consumption so yeah, which is offset in part by, well, a tiny amount by moving to our new building, which is, is achieving um, savings mm. and emissions and costs, actually. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, Warren, do you have a question? Yeah, thank you. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, just have you factored into the account just how much of an impact COVID had on this? Uh, and I do note your, your trends down from 16, 17, yeah. heading downwards, and then obviously we've had those couple of years in the middle. Is, is there a factor in there for that? And were, were more staff staying away and working away and not coming in, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah, through you, Madam Chair. They, oh, okay. sorry, Karen, did you want to? Yeah. <laughs> yes, the COVID did have a significant impact both on, both on our air, air travel and also on, you know, just the amount of our fuel consumption because we weren't travelling around as much. And, and the last year, the 2023, that's to date, I take it all over the... But that's not a full year. Yeah, so that's only a six-month period to date. So you can see that it is trending up it's for um, down. yeah. So we actually need to be actively managing air travel, for example, um, to you know continue to achieve emission reductions. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, Stu. Um, I just want to and look. I've raised this before, but it's a year or two ago now, but. The inclusion of um, the emissions from our, particularly our drainage operations in our corporate emissions, how much sort of thinking have you done about whether we should be doing that or not? And the reason I ask that question is that um, we do that because the farmers in those areas need a coordinated drainage response to make sure that everyone plays the game. Um, the part of the world that I farm in and, and the significant part of the region, we don't have to do that because 
so much for that. If my neighbour doesn't clean his drains, I don't really get his stuff. You know, that's his problem. But but the point I'm trying to make is I'm not convinced that those emissions should be regional council corporate emissions, if that makes sense, because it's inconsistent with the way the other drainage related emissions from the rest of the region um, are calculated, if that makes sense. Or yeah, who bears responsibility for them? Perhaps yeah. the way of separating them out, you mean, like, Stu, like public transport's kind of put on. Yeah. Any thoughts? And I suppose, and I'm not saying it, it should be, um, where I'm going with that is that if we're to incentivise behavioural change, regardless of what part of our, um, our um, national emissions profile we're looking at, it's it's important that those the emissions are sheeted back to the to the generator of them, if that makes sense, you know, as, as, as a general concept. Whereas we don't actually have any control of that because we say to the beneficiaries, the landowners, hey, what level of service do you want or what level of service are you prepared to pay for? They say this and say that, why do you know? Yeah, because when the farm environment plans start coming in, obviously if you've got your drainage done by regional council, that may end up on our carbon balance sheet rather than theirs, whereas if yeah. you do your own drainage, it ends up on your own farm plan, right? Is that, is that kind of where we're... It's, if you could... It's, if you it's could inconsistent. Add, that would be... Yeah. So, Madam... There you go, Lisa. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of drainage from our um, emissions from our flood pumps, at the moment we only report and include emissions directly arising from the operation of those flood pumps, so the electricity or the mm -hmm. diesel that is required to power them. So that's because we're operating and delivering that service, they rightly, I guess, fall to the council. One of the questions that we've been working through is how, how do we approach those emissions from drained organic soils? And um, we've talked it for, very, you know, for several years about including it in the corporate inventory just as a way to start highlighting the issue. Where we landed is that in the regional greenhouse gas inventory, which is currently being prepared by um, EnviroStrat and um, and staff and Mike's team, that we actually will include emissions from drained land and, and some analysis around that in the regional inventory as a further means to start beginning that conversation. And I mean, it's, I guess, also then links into some of that, you know, the sustainable infrastructure decision making framework that we've got that, you know, there's a whole heap of really complex factors that we need to incorporate when, we, when we're making decisions around around that. Uh, Robbie, can I ask you to turn yours off and we'll come, I've got you down. Um, Sorry, you just, if I just take you back, you just said we provide that pumping service, um, shifting water from drains up, and, and so we quite rightly report that as our corporate emissions. D did you appreciate where I was coming from when I was questioning why we do that? Did I, did, yeah. I'm not sure if I explained it clearly. In terms of the, the portion of farmers in our region that that utilise the regional council to provide their drainage services versus the portion that do it themselves. Did, did you understand what I was saying? Oh, oh, yeah, I, I, see what you, I do see what you mean now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so yeah. I'm questioning the logic, um, and I'm not, an expect, I'm not expecting a yes and answer right now, but as to whether we, we were doing that the right way in terms of... Yeah, so, sorry, Stu, we do, do get where you're coming from. So we um, account for all of our activity or the services we deliver. So as Lisa said, the pumping is something that we must fund irrespective of who's benefiting from it. It's the same as if we were to be flying people from A to B and they were paying us their fare. That, it's that fee for service type thing is, is you are then accountable for those emissions. It out, maybe. Be great. Yeah. Uh, I'll go to Pamela. Yep. Now, I, I get what you're saying because mm. what I'm hearing is I mean, the only reason we're pumping is because we have a level of service agreement with those targeted ratepayers. If we didn't have that level of service agreement, we wouldn't have any um, pumps running in that area. Yeah. 
in in certain circumstances. Yeah. That's the idea. So you're saying, why do we count the emissions that are associated with a service that we provide to another business or another entity? Hmm. We're inconsistent with the fact that a big chunk of our region's farmers do their own drainage. Mm. Mm. Um, and, another and we chunk, don't count that. Another chunk need a coordinated Effort. drainage mechanism. Yeah. And so, rightly or wrong, they chose, they chose to get the regional council to provide that service. Hauraki chose to use the district council to provide right. it. Um, we have some farmers that want to withdraw from that because they want to do it themselves. Right. We had some Trevor Simpson in here last yep. term saying, hey, we want to do our own thing, you know. Mm. And so that immediately comes off our books. Mm. Um, but if that all yeah. makes sense. But but um, in terms of, of sheeting the responsibility for the emissions mm. back to those or the entity that are charged with wanting to reduce them, um, it's part of our, our national approach. That It's not a... The yeah. incentives aren't in the yeah. right place. Yeah, yeah. No, makes sense. Um, uh, thanks for, for raising that. Um, I, I suppose my question is on uh, paragraph eight, where you're talking about the new um, ISO standard that requires the consideration of additional significant indirect emissions. Um, and you've you've talked about our public transport as being the first step. Are there, uh, what else are we going to have to report on? Um, through you, Madam Chair, we need we need to carry out an analysis of what our significant emission sources are from our suppliers, and work through. There's there's a sort of quite a methodology that's um, set out, and you know in the ISO standard as to how we do that. So we need to the initial kind of screening methodology is just based on spend. So then we need to look and say, okay, which ones of these are actually significant or material. So I mean, public transport is was essentially a very clear candidate. The others we need to work through. I was just um, just reflecting on on the question that Tippa was asking earlier around our resourcing, because I just am wondering how big of a job is that? You know what I mean? The Not only the analysis, but then the the additional reporting, uh, the accumulation of the of the data and the reporting of it. Just wondering how much. Um, gets continued to be added to the process of this accreditation, accreditation. Yeah, so the, so I think the analysis itself is probably, is relatively straightforward. Where I think the additional time and labor will come in is at what point, how far do we decide we want to go in terms of implementing, um, you know, those emission reduction strategies with, with suppliers. So it's, a, you know, there, there's, I guess, what we need to do as a minimum to comply with the program. But then there's also at the other end of the scale, what is it that we should be doing, you know, as to show leadership in this space and, you know, the, actually the cascading effect of if we as a council and it's in our current procurement policy, we should be seeking low carbon goods and services, you know, the flow on effect through society and the economy, if that's how we are asking our services and goods to be provided. I've got a few small questions. I'll try and go through them pretty quickly. Three are in to do with the building that we're in. Uh, one is uh, it mentioned about the other tenants that are in the building. And so the way that we calculate it is that it's a proportion of floor area from the total building. Do you, um, are you aware of the other tenants are on their own path with their own carbon emission reduction plans so that you know they're helping everyone's helping out trying to reduce that because if you know they weren't and it was things were going to do we keep an eye on what they're doing to either of you not yet yet okay not that i'm aware of that could which just be interesting thanks um and then the i saw the regular night audits were annual um it was put down on the table and i just wondered whether frequent enough for finding those efficiencies just leave it with you yeah um, oh, I, I could I just add that at when we were at Gray Street we actually carried out the audits more frequently than annual but um and as we're sort of in the process of bidding into the new building the properties and facilities team have been focusing on making sure that the building has been performing as commissioned and then the bigger one on the building would be um, are we looking at options for how to utilise the building better? Because um, I am aware that 
with the whole move to this building and more remote working, there are times when the building's more empty than it could be. And so are we looking into that, um, especially because we're talking as well with the um, improvement project with transport about co-locating staff and all that, all those opportunities. Yeah. Yep, that certainly is a conversation about how do we um, co-locate, how do we collaborate, how do we share this building with people um, when it's available to do so, and that's been sitting with our colleagues in property. Awesome, awesome. Okay, two last ones, and that was um, around, we had to think about whether there's a way to collect the data on a continuous basis, so and perhaps even display it over time, but more frequently rather than the one big yearly effort. So something I was going to ask for the regional inventory as well, actually, next time we meet. <laughs> but yeah, yeah we, do, we do actually, um, part of this work, as well as having the annual inventory, we have a, a quarterly um, energy and emissions reduction group that meets, and we actually check in on the, on the data quarterly um, to see how we're tracking against, you know, targets. Oh, awesome. And so that information's... Um, yeah, yeah, report yeah, held in a carbon software by a carbon right. software company and uses our invoices to help calculate that and actual consumption. Cool, and that messaging then goes out to staff to help drive that progress, hopefully. It certainly goes to those staff who have accountability for certain cost areas right. and we're able to show them if their costs are accelerating or if they have increased and it does allow us to have an early look to see what's going on two, three years. Um, my very last one was just, I'm aware that as we pull in these other scope three topics, such as public transport, we talked in the past about maybe having to review the baseline um, and just your latest thinking on that, uh, sorry, reviewing yeah, baseline and targets, but at the same time while reading it and talk, thinking about all the intricacies like what Stu raised, I do like this idea of perhaps chunking things and having their own targets so, because some things just for members benefit like public transport, I actually wouldn't mind those emissions going up because they're displacing uh, carbon emissions from private vehicles if people are, and the patronage is increasing as a good thing over as a whole, even if it isn't for our footprint as an organisation. Any, any comment on baselines and thinking there for the future? So as part of the transition to the ISO, the new ISO standard, we will be re-looking at our baselines and but we we agree that it's actually useful to to essentially chunk out some of these big emission sources because for example if you're looking at seven thousand close yeah. to seven thousand tons of carbon dioxide from um from public transport it dwarfs any any improvements that we're actually making in our corporate and operational emissions very well benjamin oh just a question when you're purchasing electric vehicles do you take account of the full cost of extracting the cadmium, getting the copper, all you know, there's a whole lot of stuff you have to do to make the vehicle and the battery. Is that included or are we just looking at electricity here that's used? I was going, do you want me to answer that, Karen, or do you want to answer Well, you were asking that? about the vehicle purchase. So yeah. at time of purchase, yeah. um, that certainly was part of the considerations for the cost of life, whole total cost okay. of life of the vehicle. Right. But what you reported here is simply the Operational. operating costs. Yes. Good. Um, is there something on? Oh, Robbie, yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Apologies. Um, this, the question that Stu brought up, I just, I might be asking a dumb question here. But, oh, no, it's a um, complex one. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, got no, I got no problem with what you said, Stu, but they're the same rate payers that are most probably subsidising transport that they're not using either. So that's a double-edged question, really, because are they going to get carbon credits back for subsidising transport that they don't use? Mm. So it's, like, it's a really hard... When you start picking things like that, then there, there's always a counter-argument. And so I, I, I don't know. It, it, when you start diving into that, I really start struggling with it. But anyway, thank you. Yeah, no, I think what I took from before was that it'd be quite cool to have a deep dive into into that sometime. So I've put it down on the list for um, kind of workshop topics to cover off, which is, or touching base at least, even if it's not a workshop, it's at least an invitation to come and have a chat about 
things. But yeah, on that one, I think it was mainly around where does the where does where does it fall? Because it can either fall on with the farmer as something that they take into consideration, or it falls something we take under consideration. Yeah, and, and it's just we don't want to double count things as well. No, no, yeah. but it also that means that if you go that way, why doesn't he get a credit for subsidising transport? Uh, generally, uh, when there are kind of because it's credit, credit things involved, it's the same about not double counting them. Yeah, but he yeah. will never use it, so or she will never use it. Now, I'll catch up with you online, but I was, I was more looking to make sure we've been consistent with how the ag sector as a whole is, it? is yeah. emissions recorded and the transport sector, how those were recorded, whatever other sector it is. It wasn't trying to, um, yeah, I'll, I'll pack it off fine. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. Right, then um, I don't think we had anything else, so... Yeah, I'm happy to move that we just received this report. Benjamin, happy to second. Yeah. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Um, against? Carried. Cool. Um, well, we've made it through our first meeting. We've learned some stuff and touched on some topics, sensitive topics. Um, next steps will be that we do have a workshop coming up in the next little while, which will be for the Climate Action Roadmap to be workshopped, and then it'll come back to us next meeting. Some other um, items that will come to our next meeting are kind of on that page nine, I think, of the agenda, which was on that table, so you can expect something that looks roughly like that, but I'll touch base with everyone as well. Um, Karen, did you have any last thoughts about the meeting or anything else? No, thank you very much, councillors. Thank you, Chair. Leave it to you to close Great. the meeting. Well, thank you, everyone. Um, I will just take us through the karakia for closing, and then I will um, declare the meeting closed after. So feel free to um, talk along if you'd like. Uh, unahia, unahia. Unahia mai te uru tapu nui, kia wātea, kia māma. Te ngako, te tinana, te hiningaro. I te ara takatu, hoia rā e rongo, e whakaira Ake ki runga, ki a tina, tina, homie, huie, taiki. Thank you, everyone. We'll declare the meeting closed at 3.33, which is early, so we can go home. And if anyone has anything else they'd like covered off in more detail, just get in touch, please.